Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at Earsports.com. This is a Paramount podcast. I am Mike Casaza, joined by Chris Anderson on a Monday morning. That means it is time for the Q&A mailbag filled with the best and brightest questions from our subscribers. It's been a... Chris, it hasn't been great <laughs> after the first couple of games. And I don't know where we're going to go today. Uh, West Virginia was one and two, even the one... Felt a little cheaping because it was at the expense of an FCS team that gave West Virginia a bit more of a, a battle than probably anticipated. The other games are losses and, and uh, discouraging for different reasons. Here's a win into the open week, win in the sales. And I um I peeked at the questions. I kind of had an idea we were going and I wasn't sure what the mood would be. So I was kind of like, you know, 50, 50, maybe like 55, 45. I don't know who's got the 55, but it's um it's pretty much like that. It's uh cautiously optimistic, but also concerningly disappointed too. There, there there's a lot of emotions involved. Obviously, people are trying to sort things out, but maybe this is the point too. This is kind of TBD. It's a very much a choose your own adventure from this point out for West Virginia. And judging by the events of yesterday, not just in Morgantown, but around the Big 12, it is really gonna be an adventure. Yeah, I, I think. I don't know if it was soothing, uh, relieving, whatever for West Virginia fans, any way comforting at all to see other teams go through complete meltdowns that, you know, fans have seen in Morgantown. I mean, it was, oh, hey, you're going to Stillwater. You brought this up in the postgame pie. That's a tough place to play. And it wasn't not for Utah on a backup quarterback. It didn't look very tough at all. And then as someone put on our board, that's the first time in a long time I've seen a Kansas State team just completely fall apart at the seams in every which way possible. So that's something else. You saw what happened to Colorado beating Baylor. I mean, back in miraculous fashion, hitting the Hail Mary, then taking it to overtime. So just a reminder, this is college football for 131 out of 133 teams, 130 out of 133 teams in most years. So – it is what yeah, oh god, I almost said it is what it is. And I know that how that's gonna trigger some people yeah. on the board. So let's let's not say that. But yeah, it, it, there was a lot of craziness in the Big 12. West Virginia came out on top to get a win. And yeah, I'm with you. It, it still seemed like people were and it, I'm not saying they're wrong. So still a little eh, not so sure about that. And that's a fine way to feel, and I think maybe the correct way to feel, if you in my opinion. Yeah, I think if you put let the contenders and it's a big group of contenders right now you know, one, two games in. Um, if you did like the Venn diagram, you would find a lot of overlapping problems. Like gave away a game they shouldn't have, blew a lead, has a quarterback issue, coordinator under fire, coach's seat could be cooler. I mean, even the teams that, that could end up in Dallas or playing for a spot in Dallas in the final week of the second to last week, they have a lot of the same problems. So it's not unique to West Virginia. Some of the some of the ways that West Virginia may deal with it, that could be unique, but that's also, you know, sometimes solutions are unique too. So give them credit for being creative, I guess, with some of these things. So we'll see what happens. But um, listen, there's going to be a lot of questions during the week, obviously. It's just an open week. You have just the head coach tomorrow. Um, actually, this afternoon, what am I saying? So he'll have some answers. And then I don't know if it's good or bad, but the time, the next time that you get the coordinators and the players, a whole new set of outcomes in the Big 12 would be a week further away from just the, kind of a head scratching. How do they do this good and bad performance against Kansas? And um, I know Chris, perhaps we can answer some questions and provide some levity here, but it just kind of feels like eh, is, is maybe the the standing response to a lot of these two, because you just don't know right now, which is at, at a two and two record with the way they played and lost games and even won games. That's probably about seems appropriate. I would guess. See, I, th I thought you were trying to talk all our, our, our way out of uh, having to do this mailbag. Like, Hey, good. You know, yeah. Who knows? Moving on. Next week, we'll come back and try again. Exit right. meeting. Yeah. yeah. All right, but now we'll we'll answer the, we'll ask we'll you'll ask the questions. We'll answer them. Um, we got a handful in here, pretty good ones, and you guys did a nice job of upvoting the ones you wanted to get answers to. So, without discrimination, I am simply going to scroll down the message board posts and pick out the ones that had several. Upvotes. Can't say that some of these are my favorite questions, but these are the ones you guys want answered. So we are going to try our best. Very democratic of us. Yes. Um, Fatty, two Ds. 
says, yes or no, is WVU better in the hurry up, fast tempo style of play? And if so, why are they so reluctant to play fast? Yes. And because you can hurry up and punt, which is not great. The lesser defenses on the field, the better. And again, you're you're just limited. Like West Virginia has like a Rolodex of offensive ideas that it likes. And when you go into a, a hurry up, you have your personnel and you're limited to plays that you've worked on with those those players and those formation combinations. And I think contrary to what people think, I, I don't know, Chris, how many plays do you think an offense goes into it into a game? Like twenty? Yeah, as I say, the Depends on if we're talking variations and stuff like that. But, yeah, a couple dozen, and then get some variations, the same play, but different lineups, all that stuff, or different formations, et cetera. You, you just don't have time to practice a bunch of stuff. So you're, you're not going in with the full complement of plays anyways. It's not like Madden or, or NCAA where you have the whole, like every formation and every every alignment in the formation and the personnel group, and you can just go to, you know, arrow down three times, arrow over twice, and press C. Like, you can't do that. Um you don't you don't have the time to rep all that in practice. You're going in with a, a small, not a small, but like a, just an adequate number of plays, and then you're refining that even more when you go up tempo because you can only do what the personnel in the field does. So you're not going to be doing what you can do in like ten personnel. Can you do like a bunch of outside zone and ten personnel? Maybe if if like your tight ends out there and you can flex out if you're an eleven personnel, but you're limited and you're calling you know four run plays, four pass plays, something like that out of a hurry up. Now, can you get down the field in those four plays? Yeah, probably. Can you do that over and over and over? I don't know. I think defense will get a beat on you and then try to figure it out. The reason it works so well is that defenses have to be simple. They really can't gamble. They can't gas themselves. They can't get out of out of control with um just just different ways to stop you. A lot of them are just like stay in front of you and tackle and maybe not get out of bounds so they can sub or something like that. But it sounds really good, but it's it's realistically it's it's kind of a limited idea. Can I go back real quick? I- I'd like to know what what controller you have that has the letter C on it? Yeah, it's like on it's, this is on like an Atari or something. What is, what is this going on here? Because even the Nintendo is AB, right? And the PlayStation yeah. are triangle, square, X, and circle, right? So yeah, my bad. You can't press the triangle button. I guess even that would be back, right? Yeah. Scratch that from the record. Yeah, come on, Boomer, get it right. I'm with you. I I do wonder about situations of uh, hurrying up to the line, like no no more huddling. I, I know they do that some. Um, because we've seen it in the past uh, with previous coaching staffs. We've seen it with this staff some. We've seen it at other schools. Of It's not so much a hurry up off. I mean, it can be, but it's hurry up and get to the line, and then we're ready to go if we see an opportunity to take advantage of this hurry up offense. If not, we pause, we break, we look to the sidelines, we make sure the walkie-talkie's working, we get a new play call in, and we can kind of, you know, let the play clock run down from there. So it it feels like a hurry up because there are no there are no breaks, there are no opportunities to sub, and you can maybe catch the defense off off guard, but you can also slow it down. I'd be interested to see if they do a little bit more of that moving forward. Yeah, I feel like the check with me is kind of a lost art too. <clears throat> that used to be something that you go up and you'd clap <clears throat> the defense to show what they're doing. Is this guy blitzing? Is he dropping back? You can stop. <clears throat> this is not great for audio, but you look over to the sideline, you get another signal because they're still calling signs in. I think that's something you can do because then you, you are drawing for more plays. You're, you're taking more time. You're not doing a true hurry up. You're hurrying to the line and you're making them show their hand. And then you can go into a deeper bag of plays. That That's something that could work. We just haven't seen them do a whole lot of that. So maybe that's something that grows because there is something to sparking green and the offense that way. Next question comes from Dub V got M. If Kansas runs the speed option on that late third and three instead of whatever dumb running play they tried, are we reading a hot board material right now? No. Do they win the game? Uh, I, I like their chances a lot more. That just seemed obvious to me, and maybe it was so obvious that it's a bad call. But in that in that situation, you don't you do what the other team does not want you to do. And I was just thinking, what does West Virginia struggle with? The reverse? They're not pulling the reverse out there. I don't think that's too long developing of a play, especially when West Virginia is coming at you because they know you're going to run it. But if they're coming at you and you have defensive backs and linebackers in conflict because do I get number six? Do I get number four? Is he going to pop pass to the tight end? Like, what can we do here? 
that would really worry me if I was West Virginia. And I just, I refine it to something very simple. I, I'm going to do what the defense does not want me to do. And I would think that Jordan Leslie is sitting there just thinking, you know, I'd really rather they not run that speed option that's gotten us a couple of times. I think including on a fourth down too, right? That just seemed like a way for them to fall forward and get two yards. And and by the way, third down, right? Like you got two plays there. And what they did, they lost yardage on, I believe. Yeah, they did. That, that just, and that, that just makes you as a play caller go, oh, didn't like that. And now... Now you really got to think about now that now the defense is like, you know what? Stay out, stay out in the field. I dare you to run something, you know, because we feel pretty good right now. And now you're like, well, I don't want to do that either. So you got to punt. So I would have, I would have done that because I think West Virginia did not want to defend that play. I might have done play action. I might have done RPO, but what they did just did not work for me because they were, they were coming at you. They knew you were going to run and they were going to stretch out and be able to stretch out with the run. They were going to come inside and be able to come inside with the run. Like whatever West Virginia saw, they were going to react to. It's a lot harder when there's options attached to what they see. And they had a hard time defending that play. Beast WV, are Spells and Crandall an improvement? Or did WVU get lucky with Jalen Daniels missing wide open receivers? I think it's a great question. That's something that hopefully Brown gets into because I think you have to account for the opponent, which you look a little bit better against Kansas for sure. And similarly, you might look a little bit better against West Virginia's secondary. So there's something in the middle in between there. I think Spells was fine. Um, I was surprised that Hollis played as much as he did. And I'd be curious to see if they thought about that and what that means for him going forward. I don't know what the deal is with um, with Crandall. I think I said in the postgame podcast that he came back in the game. Now that I think about it, I don't believe that's true. So I'm not sure where he's at. Probably doesn't need to be returning a cover in punts right now, especially if he's going to Run into, get run into by a teammate. So maybe we lighten the workload there a little bit for him in the future. Um, I would say that it's maybe not a net positive that they had to play differently. And what did we say? It was like a more understanding secondary. <laughs> like we understand you can't do the things we need to do, but we're going to build a defense around what you can do. Not, not even that complicated, but we're just going to ask you to do what you can do, which worked against that opponent. So more importantly, could they do that against Bowman and Oklahoma State? Probably not. So are those the two guys who will be asked to play against Oklahoma State? Don't know. So um, I think for a day it worked fine. I don't think – I don't have any problems with spells. Crandall looked fine out there. The one thing that I thought about Crandall was they said he was athletic and he could run. He really did move around pretty well with receivers too. I thought that was encouraging. So onward and upward with them in what capacity and what style of defense, I don't know. But I would I would certainly keep an eye on the Aubrey Burke situation because that might mean Garns plays a lot of nickel or spear, if you will, because they did not play Zay Jennings one snap. Now, maybe they can heat him up during the two weeks in between games. They can change that. They probably didn't practice him much of at all, so he didn't get to play. And then Hollis. Like, Hollis, for all of his warts this season, should be, if not their best cornerback, maybe one of their two best cornerbacks. Is that just completely out the door? Or did he kind of, like, step on the front porch and and – have the keys in his hand yesterday and he's ready to to come back into the conversation. Those are, those are things you have to look at and maybe even inquire about. Yeah. For me personally, watching the game with my eyeballs. And again, for those that didn't listen to the post game pod, I was kind of going through rapid fire for the first three quarters. I was skipping through the, the in-between time between plays. I was skipping over the conversations being had with the TV announcers, the commercials, all that stuff. So, but they looked trying to think of a polite way to put like like i i didn't feel what strongly one way or the other about them i i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing but i i didn't feel like they were the problem i didn't feel like they were the solution um i'm curious if this question was i'm trying to see the timing on it because we did post the pff uh grades this morning and spells what ended up dead last on the team really and, and pf marks yeah and he was one that maybe I thought played the best out of the the options there. And, and Crandall was only slightly better, both well below average. So mm. it's <laughs> to quote a man, it is what it is. And there's no one in the bullpen. So there you go. I, again, I think it's a good, I'm with you. I think it's a great question because I'm not sure I have an answer for it right now. And I'm curious if WV does either. That's the one. I'm not sure they have one either. It might be a, like a an incomplete in NA right now. Yeah. Uh, next question. C. Hush. Honest assessment of Trotter and Lathan. Half the people on this board think they're terrible, and the other half think they're one of the best units on the team. Who is more right? Ooh. Well, 
I'll, I'll just kind of reiterate what I said. Like I went back and I I, I saw this question. And actually, there's a pretty animated thread about this on our board. So I went back and I I just cherry picked some stuff, some sequences. So I wasn't looking for good. I, was, I wasn't looking for like three and outs I knew existed or touchdowns I knew existed. So I just kind of like blindly went into it. And I can see what they're saying. Like they, but I also think that kind of going to the wrong spot sometimes is because Kansas was really patient, especially high shot. Like when he went in the middle, he skipped around him and poked a little bit. And, and Neil's just really good too about seeing something in one spot, but not going there until it's like really, really open. That's one of his gifts, I think. So high saw is a little bit different, a really strong guy who can run through people to get to his spots, but he also picked his moments there. So what does that mean right here? That means they're better than the linebackers. Sure. But I really think this is the case. I think that the linebackers played back. I just think that there was more room and they were trying to help the secondary. And whether it's like the crossers underneath, um, they use their tight ends a bunch, whether as receivers or runners too. Like you're going to back your linebackers up a bunch, I think. And and they just did not want to get beat over the top. And and it just didn't happen. I know they, they were two for five, I think, on 20-yard passes, which kind of surprised me because I don't remember a lot of vertical stuff happening which means that part of it worked, but that also means that everybody was back a little bit too. And then when you lose Burks, you know, relatively early in the game and you add another linebacker there, I think you're, you might be more stout in the run. You're not as quick to spots um, because Burks is really good about getting outside and setting the edge. The spear in general does that. Like the force defender that makes you go back inside or doesn't let you get outside. Tr I think Trotter was mostly playing that. I'm not sure it's his thing. I think maybe I always thought Latham would be that kind of guy, but They've obviously rehearsed this. I thought that was the best. So maybe he wasn't in the best situation for himself too. In the in the moments where they were like real four two five or whatever they call this now, like they say it's a three four, but when they had their their three linemen in and their their spear, the linebackers, the bandit, I thought they were good. They they played deeper, but they had to. They ran. They covered sometimes. They ran and they tackled. Were they perfect? No, but I thought for what they were trying to do, which was different. Um, it wasn't going to look perfect either, but I thought they did a good enough job. I, listen, I, I understand what you're saying. When you look at the stats, yeah, um, that's not great. But also, if you take away the two reverses, I'm pretty sure they were under five yards of carry. That seems like a success, and you're playing that way, and you're creating that much room. Yeah, I just felt like, again, watching it kind of blindly, not know it was just they were always around. They were there, Every time there was a play being made, they seemed to be there. I agree with you that I think they were put in some awkward spots, probably put in some situations that they might not normally need to be in because of all the injuries and because of what West Virginia was trying to do defensively. Um, I also feel like, and I do believe they have a higher ceiling than this, and I'm not meaning this as a negative, uh, but because I thought he was a very good player, but there's a lot of kind of Lee Koba ish feel about this it was like, Hey, they're around a lot and they do well kind of when they're moving forward, but, I also feel like maybe it's almost you hate to say too aggressive, but they seem to be getting themselves out of the out of the correct spots and, and guys are getting open, especially in coverage and different things. And so again, I, I'm leaning more towards I think they were good. And the fact that they are both so young is very promising. So I I am on the pro Lathan and Trotter bandwagon. So they they when let me see here uh yeah eleven tackles for Trotter ten for Lathan so twenty one tackles Chris they had eleven solos and ten assists combined too so half of their tackles were solo basically and half of them were assists which means you're right they were getting to the play so if it wasn't if it wasn't one of them getting it it was somebody else they were getting there too um, and I I just think that you're gonna have a greater margin of error when you have greater area to cover and if that's new and unusual to them. Like you're just seeing more and reacting more, and the, the offensive linemen are getting up a little bit further. Uh, they use their tight ends a bunch, like I said. That 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 was probably a tricky spot for them. That's not an easy opponent to play, especially when you're seeding territory. I think that that has something to do with it. But listen, I think it's a great observation, and like it's actually a pretty pretty interesting conversation to have too, because numbers say one thing, your eyeballs say another, but you're also not maybe accustomed to seeing them play the defense that they did. But at the end of the day, when you look at their stats, you know it's. It's 247 yards rushing with 55 coming on reverses. So you're going to get tricked sometimes. Now, Flank, that happened for sure. All right, Mike. Now it's time for our sponsored question, Team Ticker Question of the Week. For those of you who don't know, Team Ticker, right here, right over my shoulder. It distracts Mike every week. He loves it so much. Uh, we are going to pick one question every couple of weeks. 
Sponsored by Team Ticker, it's a one-of-a-kind sports sign for Mountaineer fans. Whether it's football, men's and women's basketball, baseball, soccer, or more, Team Ticker has you covered. Never miss a game as the high-tech retro display provides a countdown to the next big game, as well as daily updates of the latest team news, stats, schedule, standings, and much, much more. Once you hang it on your wall, it'll be the talk of all your fellow West Virginia fans. If you're looking for that one eye-catching item to showcase your team pride or gift for that special Mountaineer fan, go to teamticker.com and pick up your team ticker today. And don't forget, post this on our message board, tweeted it. And somebody asked me about it, said, hey, what is that good-looking sign over your shoulder? I said, no, go to teamticker.com, get one, use promo code EARSPORTS, E-E-R SPORTS, and get $50 off your order next time you go through there. So team ticker question of the week. Comes from Luke Zoolander, 01. This is going to take some thought, Mike. So yeah. pull up, pull up the West Virginia football schedule. I think you know which one I'm asking here. This is another double-digit upvote one. To get to eight and four, we'd need to win six of our last eight. Based on what you've seen so far of the upcoming Big 12 opponents, can you list which games in order of most likely to least likely you think WVU can win? So, we're both okay. pulling up our schedules. We're looking at it. Looks kind of tough. Looks kind of tough. Especially if UCF is good. Especially if Cincinnati's going to be feisty. Yeah, what do you think of that score? I, I mean, Houston's defense uh, offense is horrendous. Like just yeah. absolutely horrendous. Okay. Um, but but domination. To still yeah, I mean, no matter how bad a team is, to get a real live shutout. And a college football game between two FBS teams is impressive. So okay. got to give Cincinnati credit on that. All yeah. right. Most likely. How about we draft them? Pick them. You get okay. first pick. We'll go. We'll get the top six. You can get first pick. Okay. And we'll, so we'll each go three times for our top. We got eight six, left. Let's go four and four. We got eight left. Okay. All right. Yeah, let's do it. You want to go snake or just one, two, one, two. Let's go one, two, one, two, one, two. Go ahead. Okay. Baylor. Most likely win. Yeah, that's mm. that team yeah. doesn't that that's that's a hard one to come back from, and I have no idea what's going to happen with that coaching staff because they, by all accounts, that they tuned him out last year, and if, if that doesn't do it last night, that's certainly going to push in that direction. Can't believe the Jake Spavital slander from you, Michael. Offensive I didn't say Jake. No, not Wait, Jake. He, know. he knows better than that. Yeah. Yeah. So ah uh, man, see that's tough because for me personally, I think it's a pretty clear number one Baylor at home is a pretty clear number one. So I guess my first pick would be that for the next game, most likely to win, despite the compliments I just gave them, that's Cincinnati. Like, again, impressive to shut out a team. But Cincinnati, not that far of a road trip. West Virginia dominated them last year. I could see West Virginia, you know, coming off, off a bye week. Yeah, coming off a bye week into that game. I mean, that is my first pick. I'm gonna go Iowa State. Ooh. I'm uh I'm not buying it quite yet. Need to see a little bit more. Um so far so good. Don't get me wrong. Doing what they had to do, didn't lose to Iowa, didn't like trip and fall in non conference play. That's good. Let me see it against a good team. And the thing is that like they they'll see a couple, I'm supposing, before they play West Virginia, but like at Morgantown, not a place they've been great through the years. They bullied West Virginia for um a couple years in in the past at Jack Trice, but listen, they play at Houston and then against Baylor. Totally different if you're going to get like a West Virginia at home that's got some swagger. If West Virginia has swagger, all right. You know what? Be kind of weird, I think, but I'm also going with a top twenty five team, and I'm going to say at home against Kansas State. Kansas State, their two road games, they had to come back in the fourth quarter to beat Tulane, and then they just got demolished by BYU. That a team that I'm still not sure is good. I know they are doing fine so far this year. We'll wait and see. But I worry about Kansas State's road, you know, bona fides, if you will. And I'm not – I mean, we've been saying this since before the season, or I have. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but let me see Avery Johnson for a few games before we just the the whole crowning him of like this is the next great quarterback. 
it felt mighty quick to me. And we, I like before the season, I was like, nah, I don't just chill, 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 chill. He hasn't been bad. He's not the reason they're losing. But I also wouldn't say he's the reason they're winning either. Uh, so I'm not sold on him being some giant killer at quarterback. Wait, did that I, really does that mean that I just said West Virginia is a giant? Is that what that means? <laughs> That's um, okay. that was a concerning performance last night. Yeah, just not discipline, not not their style. And that was that outlier. Maybe like, are you, do you want to get them now before they get it right? You might have something there. Um, I'm gonna go, uh, Chris. This will probably surprise people here. I think Oklahoma State's winnable. I, I think we, like, just, we just picked the next three ranked games in a row. Yeah, already. Uh, which is weird. Um, and it's a row game, and I just but like, I don't think they're scared to go there. I, they they won there two years ago. They had them last year. I know they didn't win the game, but they they really think they were they should have won that game if not for the punt. Um, I mean, never mind that Ollie Gordon had like the uh, Mario Brothers invincibility star, and you couldn't stop him. I don't like Oklahoma State's schedule. I haven't when I've seen them, it hasn't looked great. They I mean they beat up on Tulsa, but otherwise it's been kind of huh. And then I just I think if you think about the tough teams to play in succession, Utah and Kansas State back to back, having to go to Manhattan right now. And like if you believe in climbing and the Kansas State culture, that's going to be a really ticked off team. That's probably going to work out some frustration like that's going to be a physical, physical game. You play Utah, Kansas State back to back. And here comes a refreshed off of a open week. Ooh, almost said it off an open mm-hmm. week, West Virginia. Like that's that's kind of stacked in the, the visitors favor there, too. I wouldn't make them a favorite. I think that's I think that's a game that they could engineer and go in and just take advantage of an opponent that's you know taking some body blows and, and just can't can't get the hands up can't get out of the way a little bit slower because of who they played so much um, who they played before so much sure that that's advantageous to the other team that's that's a game that West Virginia could certainly steal right there. So that's five of the eight games that leaves us at Arizona versus at home against UCF and then at Texas Tech. By the way, mm-hmm. listen to that. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I, I mean, Lubbock will always worry me. I mean, anybody that anybody that is a fan of West Virginia or covers West Virginia or has kept up with West Virginia, going to Lubbock is not easy. It all goes back to 2012. And we just saw Texas Tech, right? That game was against Arizona State was in Lubbock, right? Yeah, sure was. So, yeah, they looked bad. The first two games, I mean, they struggled to beat Abilene Christian. They got demolished by Washington State. I think Arizona State's good, but Lubbock is a really tough place to play. And But that's my pick for pick six. At Texas Tech will be my pick as the sixth most likely win for West Virginia out of the teams remaining. All right. um, I'm just picking this team because – I'm more worried about the other team. <laughs> um, I, I, boy, I'm actually going to edit myself in real time here though. Cause I'm not sure. Look at this one, two, three, oof, boy. I'm a little bit worried about Trattoria McMillan and Noah Fafita um, and whoever is playing cornerback for West Virginia. So I would go Arizona as my next pick of, only and here's one reason why. Like, I, I think that UF UCF is going to be pretty good. And I, I've been on, I, I, the the worm turned on that for me a while ago when I saw who they're adding and what it was happening to their defense. And I was thinking, all right, this is this might work. So they could be home by the end of the year. And like, even though that's at home, I think it's a harder opponent than Arizona might be, right? But I'm going to pick Arizona here because it's on the road. They're going to go out of character here and probably travel a day earlier or stay a day later because it's a different time zone for them. They've never been out there. Like this is something they've been thinking about for a while. So it is an unusual game. Um, And like that pass combination, that's kind of scary. I don't know who's going to guard McMillan. I don't know how they're going to heat up, you know, uh, Fafita. I don't know what state Arizona will be in right now. Never mind a month from now. So that's going to be, you know, a lot could change by then. But the formula is pretty simple, I would think, which is throw it to your 6'5 All-American receiver with your quarterback who just a year ago was really good. And on the road, you know, maybe a night game or an afternoon game, going to be hot probably. At the end of October, West Virginia not accustomed to that. That one seems like it's maybe at these least winnable. UCF is the toughest remaining game on West Virginia's schedule. Yeah, I was going to take home. UCF because it was at home. I honestly was. But, like, I, I really respect what they're doing. All right. I'm... No notes, no notes. 
Leave it there. Love it. Okay. That was our team ticker question of the week. Again, teamticker.com. Use promo code EARSPORTS, E-E-R sports, for $50 off your next order. Mike, our next question comes from BitCruncher. He's got a question about this tight end usage. He says, we have a six foot seven tight end that's a huge target for the quarterback to throw to. So why is he not being utilized more often? You'd think that would be a natural option, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Get two catches on what three targets? Didn't get his catch until five minutes remaining in the game. I think that's right. I yeah, do recall try. that being discussed as it was happening when he made his first catch was a even our boys that were on the television who had a rough go of it. Again, I know you didn't have to deal with that. They had a rough day. What was it bad? Um, it was bad. I, and really, I only listened to them for the last quarter. It was bad. But they pointed it out. Cole Taylor, yes, two catches, three targets. None of that came until the marquee drive where he made the touchdown reception and the way more difficult than I think people are like not discussing here. Catch on that two-point conversion. Yeah. like That was outstanding. But what do we think? He was like their third receiver, it seemed like at times. He was on the field a ton. Um, he played 55 snaps here. So for a non-offensive lineman, not quarterback, only Clement played more. So, you know, they're down receivers a little bit. And he was out there a lot in like what was basically 10 personnel. I know he's a tight end, but he was out there like as a slot receiver. They used him in bunches. They used him a lot. And I have no idea how he didn't get involved. He ran 30-something routes. He only stayed in. He ran 32 routes. He only stayed in a pass block five times. So of the 37 pass plays he's on the field, he ran a route 32 times and he got targeted three times. I don't know about that. That's unusual. Um, that's 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 curious to me. I mean, when you look at the like the, the the hit chart for Green, I mean, only I think what three receivers had catches, and then White was Jaheim White was the fourth player to catch a pass. So he really only targeted a small number of people. So why why was he the fourth in line among like tight end receivers there? Clement had a great game. Ray was getting open. They they created some stuff for Gallagher, but it would seem to me that if you're trying to get your quarterback going, the guy that he has a really good rapport with that he went to Mobile, Alabama with in the summer to get these these reps that so you can become familiar, that's the guy you might drop and do stuff on. And and you know, when he's in there for that long, he's gonna get targeted, you know, so often. That's curious to me. I'm not sure the defense was geared around stopping Cole Taylor. I watched it a bunch. You know, he did a lot of quick stuff to get open. He's not a guy that goes deep, but, you know, he was even middle of the field sometimes and, and drawing a safety. And, you know, they'd have a linebacker inside and the safety around him. So there were times that maybe he just ran into, not not a mistake, but just the way the defense was designed, it wasn't there for him. Uh, they did a lot on the outside when they passed in that game. So that was, that was interesting. But when I think about it, Chris, a lot of the stuff they did, like Clement and Ray, like, they were slot receivers on those plays. Like, I know they play outside, but, like, they were slot receivers. Did they line up in the slot as a change or they motioned in? And that's a little bit different. Or they were in a bunch and it's a little bit different. And, and you know, I'm kind of rambling here because I don't have a great answer. It would seem to me that that stuff could suit Taylor, too, without being, like, some crazy deviation of what they were trying to do. 30 targets, uh, 9 to Clement, 6 to Ray, 6 to Gallagher, 3 to Taylor, and 3 to White. Yeah, so... weird. It's a weird heat map. You're right, and it's funny because usually that list, when you look at that box score, there's nine guys on there, ten guys on there, you know, all with a couple targets or something like that. But to really concentrate his uh, his targets like that to those five guys and really only four receivers, pretty interesting. But yeah, only only targeting Taylor late. Um, let's see. Okay, this could maybe this could take. Two hours, but let's try to make it take two minutes. Okay. C. Ray Cool says the uh, the defense looked better. The offense looked better. Was it the opponent, or did we actually fix things? I didn't think the offense looked better. To be honest with you, like they hit some plays, but like they also had some other plays that you know it's part of the offense. The pass blocking um, wasn't great. I don't think, um, and and really rallied. And, and I think the defense was complicit in that because Kansas. For some reason, Kansas is like, we're not going to get beat up the rail. You know, they play deeper than deeper, wider than widest, which is fine, but they give a lot of stuff in the middle, and West Virginia was ready for that. So those two drives are are kind of misleading. The seven or eight before that, not West Virginia's best work. And, and like, the running game, 
you're talking about the target spread, Chris. How about six carries for Donaldson and six carries for White? And White didn't look very good. Um, so that's that's curious to me. I would certainly put a pin in Jaheim White's numbers. And the defense, listen, they were different. I don't think they can do that every game. Now, credit where the credit where it's due. If that was a Kansas game plan, because that's how you beat Kansas, well, guess what? You beat Kansas, so good for you. I don't know that you could run that out there against some teams. So um, it was better because it was different on defense. No question. Um, I'm not sure it was better on offense until it was better maybe because of the Kansas defense. So that makes sense. All right, one more quick one. Full city ear. At what point do we see a running back who isn't named White, Anderson, or Donaldson? To piggyback off. Do you remember Jalen Anderson? When he, when he, I don't remember him. He played covered kickoffs, I think, but he hasn't had a touch since the um, Penn State game, right? Yeah. Um, I would, I would be surprised if anybody gets in there. And if it is somebody, it's probably going to be Anderson because I think Dunbar is sitting on one game. Hubbard has not played, I don't believe. Either way, they're not in red shirt danger, so they could. But at, at what point are you doing that? You're probably going to red shirt both of them. I don't know that it makes sense. Donaldson looks fine. Like, if you stretch him out to 12 or 15 carries, he's going to get you probably in between 80 and 100 yards. You're going to be okay. Uh, White's a bit of a mystery. I don't think he's broken. I would probably just try to get those two right and not worry about subbing him out for production purposes. I would try to make sure that they're active and this productive. I don't, I don't think you get better by taking one of them off the field more consistently. All right, I got, I'm going to do one more because it's addressed directly to you, so I won't answer it in the mailbag. But DKWVU fan 100 asks, when you state in the press box and you list off the NFL scouts in attendance, do they share any details on who they are truly looking at? I mean, I, listen, I know some of these guys – through the years i see them at practice in the summer um they they sit behind us during games and sometimes during breaks you talk to them um some guys i don't know and some guys are like grizzled scouts and just like they sit there and they eat their post-game meal and they, or pre-game meal and they they are in the the game the whole time and there's it's the, they sit behind me or they sit far away i don't have time to socialize with them during the game but i know some of them just through the years so um hey how you been are you here to see so and so? Just like you know, whenever I say that, I'm always joking about somebody, right? Like somebody they wouldn't possibly be there to see, <laughs> or like if they just drafted a quarterback in the first round, like oh, you're here to see Garrett Green, um, stuff like that. But you can just get a relationship with them. But it's mostly because I've seen them for a number of years, or um, I, I know people who work for their teams to PR or something like that. So it's it's not because like I'm I'm doing gum shoe reporting there. It's not like I'm stalking the defensive coordinator on level two of the of the press box. Yeah. Um, well, Mike, I think that's going to cover everything that we got here for the audio and video portion of this mailbag. Again, I will circle back, take the rest of the questions, put them in a written format, and post them on Tuesday. Keep your eyes out. Neil Brown press conference later today. No coordinators, no players. It's a buy slash open week, and we will have plenty of content still to come. Mike, lead us out. Until then, I'm Mike. I'm Chris. We did a little bit different.